Hey everyone, so as I mentioned in um, the community page, I'm uh, on the road right now. I'm in the East Coast for work, so I don't have my usual setup. Uh, we're doing away with a mic for now because I didn't want to bring that on the plane, didn't want it to get damaged. So the audio quality is not going to be as good as it usually is, but I still have my webcam, got my computer, so uh, hopefully this, uh, this suffices for now while I'm away from home. Anyway, so what, what I wanted to talk about today uh, specifically are the the current trends you see regarding the what I, I would deem as um, a decline in Western civilization and some of the parallels uh, throughout history, uh, most notably the fall of Rome, which I think uh, I think the experience of of uh, the Roman Empire's decline in many ways mirrors uh, the the decline of Western civilization, specifically the um, hegemonic power of the West, which is the United States, and has been since um, 1945, I would say, and especially so after the fall of the Soviet Union, although, you, you know, I, I would usually classify the Soviet Union as not exactly the West, but, you know, so to say that the United States has represented the West since 1945 and has been the premier sole world power uh, since 19... Uh, since 1991, the fall of the Soviet Union. Of course, that's being challenged by China today. Some of the symptoms for that, of course, are, are the, the sort of, um, is the decline of, of Western civilization, decline of uh, the developed Western world, um, the Western man, and, and um, you know, the sort of trend of, of decadence, of, of comfort, of, of the sort of, you know, consumer society we live in that, that breeds comfort and breeds, breeds uh, access to pleasure. Um, and, you know, the fundamental theme that I think is central to all this is the necessity for, for suffering, for pain and suffering in order to further human innovation. And I have some notes that I'm going to bring up regarding that. I think that, that you know, when you, when you think of, uh, of any of the major technological advancements that have sort of propelled humanity forward, uh, they, were, they were for the most part all to solve a specific problem, right? So... Even if you go back to like ancient Greece, for example, um, you look at Athenian society compared to Spartan society. One of the the reasons why Spartan society stagnated significantly in regards to technology was their over reliance on the helot slave population. So while the the Spartans had a very militaristic, very disciplined society, uh, they were very stagnant in regards to their uh, technological advancement, specifically with agriculture. Now. The reason for this was, uh, while yes, of course, Sparta suffered a great deal um, to 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 build themselves as a premier military power and have one of the the most prominent military cultures in all of Greece. Um, they weren't suffering so much in, in regards to their food production. So the issue, and this is something that's that's brought up uh, in in Carol Quigley's uh, the historian Carol Quigley's book Evolution of Civilizations, is that because the Spartans were reliant on the helot population. Uh, to to basically produce the food uh, of the country or of the city state, uh, they never had to to create new technology to make agriculture agricultural production more efficient because they depended upon the slaves. They had a set quota, and, and based on this quota, the slaves would work and and they'd have their sufficient amount of food. And and this process worked quite easily. So easily to the to the point that. You know the slave population. They never worked harder than they had to. They had a certain amount of um, of uh, agricultural production that was necessary to sustain the population. And once they hit that quota, they sort of you know they they didn't they didn't um, they didn't try to exceed the quota. They they provided a sufficient amount of food, and that was it. And then, and then you know you have your Spartans, the citizens of Sparta. They received their adequate amount of food, so they're like, okay, well the system seems to work. So we're not going to we're not going to put anything into advancing our agricultural uh, technology, and so it stagnated. So while uh, much of of the other Greek city states, for example, or or just other civilizations in, in the Mediterranean, uh, were were advancing their their agricultural technological advancement, finding better ways to to plow the land, finding better ways to keep the soil fertile, um, to increase uh, crop yields, uh, the Spartans. Were, since they were reliant on, on the, the slave population to produce food, they never had a necessity to fulfill that issue, which might have been low agricultural uh, production yields. They never had that issue because their slave population provided um, 
the the, the necessary amounts of agricultural production. Therefore, their their technology in regards to agriculture stagnated. It stayed the same because there was no necessity. So suffering leads to innovation. You need an issue, a problem to overcome, a problem to solve in over in order to lead to innovation. You look at medicine, for example. Um, you you have uh, high infant mortality rates for 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 much of the past thousand years. Um, you have have people dying of of diseases at very young ages. Um, you know you take the sewage system and plumbing for example. These were created because of in the big cities people would just throw their their excrement they'd throw their poop you know outside they they'd pour their piss outside on the streets and you got to think about. The, the the horrible sanitation conditions in the cities if people are just throwing their human waste outside the window into the streets there's no plumbing there's no sewage system so there's all this this you know disease ridden material everywhere in the streets so so people are getting sick and and because the people are living in such cramped quarters and and they have human excrement all around them and they're constantly breathing that in they're not getting fresh air um, they're they're being surrounded by disease diseases spreading very quickly because they don't have these these necessary um, you know plumbing sewage system so that all that waste can go away and that they can leave in, in a clean and sanitized environment um, so you you have a necessity for plumbing you have a necessity for the sewage system medicine because in these big cities where people are living so close together they're all getting sick because they don't have sewage system to get rid of their waste they don't have plumbing to get rid of their waste and they don't have the proper medicine to deal with the many diseases that fester when people are living so close together one of the reasons why the bubonic plague was was so um, catastrophic was because at that time the European population had really risen to such a level that Yet all these people, especially in Italy, living so close together that the the rate of of uh, infection with bubonic plague was so quick. So uh, you know, for those of you that that don't know, the bubonic plague spread when uh, fleas infected with the plague um, would would latch onto rats, and these rats, you know, they they would um, they would go onto the sh these trade ships, and these trade ships would would come from like Asia, for example, and they would bring rats with bubonic plague with them and then those rats with bubonic plague some of them would go into places like Italy and then those fleas would jump from the rats onto people and 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 then the fleas would spread the bubonic plague to the people and with all these people living so close to each other surrounded by human filth and cramped quarters they all got sick very easily right and that was that was this 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 pain and suffering that I'm talking about the pain and suffering of disease of of um of all these different hardships that's what led to the necessity for human innovation that human innovation eventually uh, over the course of hundreds of years led to plumbing led to uh, sewage systems led to to vaccinations you know things like penicillin antibiotics all these different things to deal with this suffering and that's what fueled the human innovation and it's interesting because a lot of the times when we think of like the medieval era and why it's called the Dark Age. Well, it's called the Dark Age because things like plumbing and sewage systems existed within um, with the Roman Empire and the Roman Republic. And, and you know, after all these barbarian conquests, and you have Rome razed multiple times, burned, uh, looted, and, and you had you know the Western Roman Empire uh, fall. Uh, you had, you also lost all these different uh, technologies. You think of something, and you know this isn't necessarily you know the Roman Empire but you think of the the burning of, of the Library of Alexandria you think of all the all the ancient books all that ancient wisdom wisdom that was lost during some during something as terrible as as the burning of of the Library of Alexandria you lose all these all these books which which can't be replaced all this knowledge that can't be replaced and the same thing sort of happens with the Roman Empire um, they were performing brain surgery you know before way before the modern era back in like you know the, you know, before Christ was born, really, um, they were uh, they were providing surgeries in which they could literally take pieces of the skull apart, and, and they would put metal plates to allow the the skull to heal and to allow brain injuries to heal. They could literally go into the brain and pull out shrapnel or glass or or pieces of metal, and that's 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 quite quite amazing when you think about it. They were able to find ways to to go into the brain, take out the matter that was affecting the brain, avoid, for the most part, avoid um, infections, and, and do this at a time where, where you know, you couldn't imagine 
such technological advancements taking place, such as like brain surgery, or like I said, they had plumbing, sewage systems. Uh, the Romans they had they had um, toilets, you know, which which is which is quite the thing, and, and not just for the upper classes. Granted, you probably had a nicer toilet if uh, if you were part of the you know the patrician class, which were the upper classes. Maybe let's call them the bourgeois, the people that made up the senators and consuls and and generals for the most part. But even the plebeians and even the slaves had had toilets in in, in Roman in the you know the time of the Roman Empire. So so it was it was something that was widely accessible. And you go on to medieval kings. Now even medieval kings had had uh, had toilets as nice as as the plebeians or the slaves of, of the Roman Empire. So there was all this te te technology that was lost during the fall of Rome. And you have this this technological dark age where it takes a long time to really catch up to to the technological level of the Roman Empire, which you know lasted. You know the Roman Republic. Um, was founded after the defeat of the last Etruscan kings in 509 BC, and for the most part, people will agree that Rome, like the real idea, the Roman Empire fell around 476 BC. Of course, you have the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire uh, continue on until uh, I don't know the exact date when Mehmed the Conqueror uh, finally took Constantinople, but I believe that would have been around the 1500s. I want to say somewhere around then. So you know the Eastern Roman Empire lived on, but it was, it was very different from from the the Roman Empire, Byzantium. That that you know basically means it's a Greek thing. It, it's Greece essentially. It's like the Greek Roman Empire, Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire. Um, so it was very different from from the original Roman Empire. So after the ro the real Roman Empire in 476 uh, fell, you have a loss of all this technology, all this advancement, and you enter. A technological dark age, which is called the Dark Ages, you know, at least the medieval era, and up until you know, maybe even the 1900s, late 1800s, did you really uh, finally return to that level of technological advancement that the Romans had? Obviously, not in all areas. The Romans, for example, didn't really, you know, they didn't use um, gunpowder. They didn't have, ra you know, railways. So obviously, there's some technological advancements that that the Romans didn't have that that we did found earlier. But you know, things like brain surgery or, or plumbing or sewage system you know even in many parts of the world today they don't have proper accesses to those things which leads to a lot of um, the spread of disease so things like that plumbing sewage system advanced surgery for that time uh, didn't come about until much later uh, in our history so there's a long period of, of stagnation in regards to technological advancement and you know it's quite interesting that you know Suffering and pain breeds human innovation. When you have all these problems, it breeds human innovation. So you even think about it. Well, why did Rome fall, right? Well, Rome probably fell because people got comfortable with their their sewage systems. They got comfortable with their plumbing, you know. And these are great things, obviously, sewage systems and plumbing systems and and early brain surgery. These are all great things. But you know, to a certain extent, if 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 you if you're able to more or less solve suffering at least on a physical level if you're able to provide an adequate amount of food for your people if if you know if if the quality of life is relatively high or at least it's pretty decent um, if you lack these 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 drivers the drivers of innovation um, all stem from a problem which which causes pain or suffering and once you end up in the late stages of the Roman Empire and life is is relatively easy, especially for the native Roman population. There's less of a necessity to go out and and conquer lands. There's less of a necessity to become a legionary. Uh, there's less of a necessity to sacrifice for for the greater idea of Rome because your life is easy. If if you're waking up and your next meal is pretty much guaranteed, if you wake up and and you can use the toilet, you can bathe and you can uh, you can you can you can live a life of pleasure. You know the Romans grew very decadent morally. Um, they grew very hedonistic. They would have these these huge parties. They'd get drunk. They'd have lots of sex. You know, it was it, it was quite the 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 um, the hedonistic display. And I think that that breeds weakness because when you when you become so used to comfort and you become so used to pleasure, ultimately what happens is you become numb to it, and you're just constantly seeking that that new fix, that new 
uh, surge of dopamine. And, and it's an endless loop, you know, when we talk about Schopenhauer's will to life, it's essentially the idea that we, we as humans, due to our evolutionary biology, we are, we are in the state of nature, it is very difficult to survive. You can never really relax. You have to always be on edge for predators or, or other human tribes that are coming to, to, to battle you in, in wars, or you have to you know, constantly be looking for food. You have to constantly you know, be ready to hunt because you know, the agricultural revolution took place 12,000 years ago. It's, it's quite a new thing. Um, uh, for the most of our history, 300,000 years of our history, we were hunter and ga hunter gatherers. So that aspect of our evolutionary biology is still very strong. This idea that we must constantly be looking for food, that we can't really grow our food and guarantee our next meal. We have to constantly be prepared to do battle, whether it be against animals or other humans. Obviously, humans are animals, but you get the distinction I'm making. Um, we, we are, you know, in, in Schopenhauer's Will to Life, we are constantly focused on survival. And when survival is easy, you start to try to fulfill that, that will to survive in other ways, which is pleasure. And like I've said many times before in my videos, pleasure is essentially the overindulgence of these basic uh, necessities for survival. So overindulging in food, obviously in the wild, you don't know when your next meal is coming, so you're going to try to eat as much as possible. And, you know, you can see this in people who become obese and fat because they just have access to foods. They just eat as much as they can because their brains don't realize that's actually unhealthy to just eat as much as you can because their brains are still stuck in the Stone Age, quite literally, because they don't know when their next meal is going to come. That's that's the state of nature for most of human history. Um, you look at, like, sex, for example. You don't know... Uh, when you're going to die, therefore, if you die before you've reproduced or reproduced enough heirs, because obviously infant mortality was much higher back then, you never, you know, you don't, you, there's no guarantee your child's going to live to adulthood. So you try to have as much sex as possible to produce as many um, heirs as possible. You have as many children as possible. So nowadays you see people quite promiscuous because there's still that evolutionary biology that says we need to reproduce. You know, our, the lives of our children isn't guaranteed. Our bloodline continuing isn't guaranteed. So people are going to have lots of sex uh, for pleasure, right? Because it comes from that evolutionary biology. And, you know, when you have all these, these things that, that provide that pleasure, you know, you're not focused on, on fulfilling, solving a problem. You're not focused on ending suffering. Then you grow quite decadent. You grow weak. You grow hedonistic. And that's what happened in Rome, and that's what's happening in Western civilization today, which is really what I'm going to discuss. Um, there's no need to pick up a sword and defend your homeland uh, if if you wake up in the morning and, and breakfast is, 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 is waiting in your fridge, you know, waiting in your kitchen. Um, if the sun's shining and you have a warm bath waiting for you, you know, you have all these nice things, you know, you have a party later you're going to go to, you're going to get very drunk and it's going to be great and you're going to sleep it off the next morning. You know, when life comes easy, at least physically, right, because obviously there's a lot of mental, uh, there's a lot of mental baggage that comes from this kind of lifestyle, this hedonistic lifestyle. There's a loss of purpose, a loss of meaning. So mentally it's quite taxing, but on a physical level at least, you know, it's easy. And, and when your life's physically easy and you get caught into to this, this constant state of desiring more pleasure, you grow comfortable, you grow numb to that pleasure, and you have less of necessity, uh, or at least you feel less of necessity, less of responsibility to do the hard work which drives um, you know, society. Because it is hard work and sacrifice and blood and sweat that drives human society forward, that drives human civilization forward. It's not people that are comfortable and, 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 and try to be happy and, and, and just, you know, drink and eat all day. That's, these are not the people that drive humanity forward. And this is exactly the reason empires such as Rome fell is because you have people with, with easy access to pleasure, survival is easy, therefore they forget they forget the reality that the world is an unforgiving place and that there is someone out there today who, who is hungry and not just hungry like in the sense that they want to eat food, but they're hungry for more. They want, they want a better life. They're suffering right now. They're experiencing pain and that builds their character strong so that they have this motivation to go forward and, and, and conquer new lands, you know, seize new opportunities. That suffering and that pain is good because it leads to this, this hardened character who who realizes that the world the world is not a place where 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 you know survival where happiness is guaranteed they know none of these things are guaranteed and only through their own sacrifice and their own will and their own struggle towards towards uh, towards success 
will they be able to have a good life or just live at all? And when you have civilizations such as late stage Roman Empire or Western civilization today where survival is easy and you sort of live in this bubble of thinking, well, I live in a pretty peaceful time, you know, there's, there's, there's no wars in my country, um, there's no wars in my neighborhood, so that must be how it is in the rest of the world. Why don't we focus on, you know, world peace, for example, or let's all get along, right? This is the kind of things that can come from uh, societies that don't have a real experience of life that are sheltered from the warfare and the famine and the disease and all these horrible things that that still exist today in, in really most of the world to to one extent or another and even within their own countries even the most developed countries you take the United States United Kingdom France Germany there's still a lot of people living in poverty in those countries there's still people living in a constant state of of, of war really if you think of growing up in a gang uh, a gang infested city or a ghetto you are in a constant state of war you never know when a stray bullet can take you or you never know if if you have to you, you end up in a gang and you're fighting wars right this is the state of america still today for 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 many americans obviously not the majority but still you know we live in this bubble where we think these things don't exist so why don't we try to you know let's help our fellow man you know like oh i'm so sorry let's let's all get along but that's not the reality of the world the world's a very very uh, dangerous place and there's lots of people that want something from you and they're willing to take it and if you're not willing to protect it then you will lose what you have so all these things are good yes let's help people but if you're not helping people from a position of strength you will be overtaken and conquered by by the hard strong uh, virile man who is who is hungry for more who wants to conquer new lands and you know you have the old saying um, hard times create strong men uh, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times, right? And that's exactly what happens. See, eventually these, these, these virile, strong, hard men that have suffering and pain, they create the good life, the good society, but then, you know, their sons, their daughters, they, they inherit a better world, and then their sons and daughters inherit a better world, and eventually the ancestors, or sorry, the descendants forget that life is 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 this hard difficult struggle because it's their grandparents or their great great grandparents that had to suffer and built this good life and once that good life is built and you have all these descendants they forget the reality i think that's what's happening in the west that's what certainly what happened in rome you have a generation of of, of legionaries and, and generals and conquerors who, who settle new lands in gaul or North Africa or, or Spain or even Britannia, you know, even uh, southern Britain, modern day England, you have warriors carving out the Roman Empire. But then, you know, maybe their their children have access to an education. So maybe their children end up soldiers like them, but most of the time they won't. They end up maybe politicians or 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 tradesmen or or you know, merchants, artisans, whatever, right? They they have a better life. And then their kids have a better life, and then their kids have a better life. And before you know it, their descendants have forgotten the reality, which is life is, is, is hard. It's difficult. There are people everywhere surrounding you that want to take what you have because they don't have it, because they are strong. They're strong because they are constantly suffering. They're constantly in pain. And this is exactly what happens with the Roman Empire. You have the Germanic tribes. Um, you have the, the, the Eastern kingdoms. Um, you have um, different different groups even within the empire that that do know the hard life. They do know the suffering and the pain, and they're willing to fight to take the good life from the Romans for themselves because they know the reality of life is that it's very difficult and that there's no guarantees. Their next meal is not guaranteed. Their lives are not guaranteed. Therefore, they're willing to sacrifice in order to have the good life, in order to take it from the Romans who have grown weak and soft and decadent. And this is exactly what happened. And this is, in many ways, what, what might be happening and what, to a certain extent, already is happening within Western civilization. So just a brief synopsis of the history of Rome and then eventually the fall of Rome. So as I stated earlier, the Roman Republic was founded in 509 BC. Some of the, the major things that took place within the early history of the Roman Republic, you have the Punic War with Carthage. You have multiple Punic Wars um, ranging from beginning about 264 BC to 146 BC. Um, during this time, you have Hannibal crossing the Alps and defeating the Roman Empires in, in Cannae. I don't know if I said that right. Uh, you have 
you know, Hannibal being beaten back and, and Scipio invading Carthage itself and, and defeating uh, Hannibal in the Battle of Zama. And eventually uh, the Carthaginians are wiped out by the Romans. So that's a major, that's, that's perhaps the most major conflict within Roman history where they're fighting a relatively pure adversary. They're fighting someone relatively on their level because really from that point onwards, they're really just fighting smaller kingdoms or smaller tribes. But Carthage was the, was the real, that was the real power that, that, that threatened Roman hegemony. After that, they didn't really have another power quite as strong as, as Carthage to battle. So once they defeated Carthage, some historians will argue that it's really downhill from there. While, you know, prosperity and power-wise they went up, uh, in reality, in terms of, of suffering and pain, the things that drive human invasion, actually ended from that period. And that was the last great struggle of Rome, of course. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to this, but it's something to think about. Um, in the early Roman Republic, the, they didn't really have a professional army. Uh, it was professional in many ways compared to the rest of the world. Uh, at that time, but um, there were essentially uh, civilian volunteer soldiers, uh, mainly known as Sestadi. You also have um, the Terrarii, which are, are spear uh, infantry, who were the veterans for the most part. You have the Principes, also veterans. Um, but the Hestadi was the average Roman citizen who had to own land uh, to be a Roman citizen. And, you know, he volunteered or he was conscripted into the army during times of war. So when they the, when they battled Carthage, they they were using citizen soldiers, and this worked for a long time until you have numerous um, Germanic tribes that that came from the north and invaded uh, Italy itself, Rome itself, and and you know they lost against the Germans for many years until the general Marius um, took charge of Rome. He became a uh, permanent consul, essentially a dictator, and, and took control of the army, and he, he underwent many reforms, essentially professionalizing uh, the Roman army and building the foundations for what became the legionary. So as a professional soldier, his, his whole trade, his whole life is dedicated towards war. It's no longer the part-time citizen soldier, it's a paid professional legionary, right? And Marius' reforms took place around 107 BC, and this is a major move in the Roman Empire towards a real army, you know, a real army that can be used for conquest, and that's their sole purpose. You don't, you know, when you have a volunteer army or a conscripted army, they don't want to fight forever. This isn't their job. They want to go back home to their families. But then you get, you know, real legionaries. You, you do away with, with the law that, oh, you have to own land to be a legion, or to be in the Roman uh, army. You get rid of those laws. Then you get young men without land, you know, the, these young men who are suffering and dealing with pain, and that's what builds up the foundations of your army is people who are hungry for more. So they join the Roman uh, army, the Roman legions, with the intention of, of carving a life for themselves. Many times uh, after Rome would conquer new lands, they would give the land that they conquered to the legionaries who participate in the campaigns. So the legionaries, they had a vested interest in the success of the campaign so that they could conquer and then settle the land, um, you know, have farms and, and grow life for themselves, right? So Marius' reforms took place in 107 BC. Now, for the next 100 years, you have um, a lot of corrupt bureaucracy, especially with the patrician class. So the patrician class were the upper classes. You have the patricians at the top and the plebeians at the bottom. Um, so think of it as like sort of the bourgeois and the proletariat. And, you know, the patricians, they, they for the most part, held positions in Senate. Um, most of the generals, the high-ranking generals or patricians. Um, interestingly enough, um, so this sort of system, this this uh, Roman Republican system, it collapses with, um, with when Julius Caesar, after great many victories, he conquered Gaul, he conquered southern Britannia, um, he marches on Rome uh, with, with, with very few men, but with a lot of support from the people. And it's funny because technically speaking, Julius Caesar is a member of the patrician class, and he's marching against Pompey, who is a plebeian. But Pompey, for the most part, was backed by the Roman Republicans, he was backed by the patricians, and Julius Caesar was backed by the plebeians, or the plebeians. And, and, and Julius Caesar marches on Rome, and um, he, he claims to temporarily suspend the Roman Republic, um, and, and claims he'll reinstate it one day, and that this is necessary to get rid of the corruption and get rid of um, the corrupt bureaucracy which has become the Roman Republic. Pompey flees, um, Julius Caesar pursues him, defeats him, Pompey is betrayed by his own men and killed. Um, many of the other 
uh, Roman Republicans uh, who, were, who were also part of the Senate at the time and backed Pompey. And, and some of them were good men as well. Um, they, they also eventually died, whether by betrayal or by suicide. Uh, but, you know, eventually that Roman Republic uh, elite bureaucracy uh, was defeated. And you have a new triumvirate of power with, with Augustus Caesar. Octavian was his name before. He was the nephew and adopted son of Julius Caesar and by many seen as his successor. Um, and, and really is his chosen successor. You have Mark Anthony, one of Julius Caesar's uh, most trusted generals um, and right-hand man, essentially. You have Lepidus, a general himself. And you have this, they split the, the Roman Republic into three, um, three governances. You have Rome itself, it, Italy and Gaul under Octavian, Augustus Caesar. You have Spain and North Africa under Lepidus. And you have Egypt, of course, and, you know, Greeks, Greece and all these um, other areas in the in the Eastern Mediterranean under Mark Anthony. Now, obviously, as you know, Julius Caesar had a romance with Egyptian queen uh, Cleopatra, or Egyptian pharaoh Cleopatra, and then Mark Anthony eventually has uh, affairs with her as well. But um, when when Mark Anthony and Octavian begin to uh, you know have conflict with one another, eventually Augustus Caesar defeats Mark Anthony. Um, tracks him down to Egypt. Mark Anthony is destroyed, defeated, and Augustus Caesar, Octavian, founds the Roman Empire. Now, this really begins, although you know we say, well, maybe Rome lost its edge after the Carthaginian War. That's when the last great struggle happened. Um, the golden age of Rome really takes place during the Roman Empire, in my opinion. So, for the next uh, 200 years, you had, you had bad emperors during that time. You obviously had Nero, we also had a lot of good emperors. Um, you had, you know, the Roman economy at that time was was fueled by expansion. It was an expansion fueled economy. Um, their economy uh, flourished when they conquered new lands and brought back all the loot from those lands, and and they they had new lands to farm, new lands to extract resources from. So generally speaking, the Roman Empire was usually, at least in its early history, at war. And um, you really see the golden age of the Roman Empire during the reign of the five good emperors. Um, that was Emperor Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, uh, Tonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. Up until Marcus Aurelius chooses his own son, Commodus, to succeed him. And Commodus, if you've ever watched Gladiator, that's a fictional account. But it does, in many ways, sort of you know, show you what, what, what really that time period was about. Commodus um, was a horrible emperor and ended this reign of the good emperor. And you start to see a decline in Rome. Um, now, the interesting thing about the, the reign of the five good emperors is they never chose... Uh, an actual member of their family. They, they didn't pick their son, for the most part. To succeed them, they picked the best candidate. So Marcus Aurelius was picked for for his his um, his ability to rule. And and it's interesting because this reign of the five em good emperors ends when Marcus Aurelius chooses his own son, Commodus, to succeed him. And that's when everything goes downhill. You know, all these different uh, Roman emperors were picked because of their merit, because of their ability to rule. So therefore, they were good rulers. And this is this, also this idea of suffering and pain. Maybe they, they grew up, you know, and they did grow up in good families, but they, they took it upon themselves to seek suffering in the sense that they wanted to be more. They wanted to be greater. They wanted to work hard so that they one day could lead. But Commodus was born into uh, the, the title of emperor. He was born into the the concept that he was going to inherit the empire from his father. Therefore, he didn't really need to work extra hard. He didn't need to seek suffering because his position was for the most part guaranteed. So while you have all these five good emperors, they're working very hard because their their leadership is not guaranteed. You have Commodus not seeking suffering because he is receiving almost a hereditary, you know, it, it's a hereditary transfer of power from Marcus Aurelius to uh, his son Commodus. So that's 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 one of the catalysts of the fall. Again, the fall of the Roman Empire is coming due to the lack of pain and suffering that drives human innovation. Uh, it's it, it begins with a ruler who is born into comfort. He's born into seeking pleasure, and, of, and Commodus did seek pleasure uh, quite quite frequently. He he desired uh, worldly things, worldly pleasures, um, and and as we've spoken. A comfortable and pleasure and pleasure-filled populace isn't strong. They they grow weak. They grow negligent to the reality of the world. Whereas the man, 
even if he's not born into suffering. If he seeks suffering and he seeks to simulate suffering in his life, then he can still build a very good uh, basis um, of his character if he seeks suffering and, and he seeks to be more than, than he is given, right? And throughout um, the sort of decline of the Roman Empire, a common occurrence you see is that less Roman citizens, like Roman citizens from Rome, want to participate in campaigns. They're born into relative luxury, they're born into relative comfort, access to pleasure. Therefore, they don't want to fight in the wars, they don't want to join the Roman legions, they want to live a good, easy life. So you start to see a significant rise in, in the dependence on foreign auxiliaries. So these auxiliaries are pulled from different corners of the empire. You have um, auxiliaries from like Syria, from Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, from Egypt, for example, North Africa, Spain, Gaul, which is modern day France. You have them pulled from all corners of the empire, but they're not Roman, right? Um, they, some of them might buy into this idea of Rome and they might see themselves as Roman, as Roman citizens, but they don't have as much of a vested interest in Rome because they're only Roman really in name. The real Roman people exist on the Italian continent and those people themselves didn't want to fight for Rome anymore. Um, so when you start to depend on foreign auxiliaries, well, the auxiliaries might say, well, you know, I'm the one fighting for this, this empire. How come I don't have more power in this empire? And, you know, it makes sense. They deserve more power if they're putting in more work. But what you see then is you see less of this social cohesiveness in regards to the stability of the empire because you have all these people that now feel they deserve more power. And you have a conflict of power. You might have, you know, someone in, in France, you know, modern, or modern day France, which was Gaul at the time, you might have some of them come up and say, well, we need more power. But then you have some people in, in Spain, for example, well, we want the power, right? We've been putting in a lot of troops towards the Roman legion. We should have a more political say, right? So you start to have this, this instability that comes from, from jostling of power because the Roman population is depending upon uh, different groups to fuel their war machine. And, and this is very similar uh, I think to Western civilization today, I think that less people in the West are are willing to 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 put in that sort of of the that simple basic um, human drive towards you know war. You know, even if you if you're not waging war, you must be skilled at war because it is the threat of violence that creates peace. Essentially, it's this it's this agreement, this 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 you know social contract, this agreement that okay, well if you attack me and I can attack back and hurt you you're less likely to attack me, right? If I'm weak and I can't defend myself, of course you're gonna attack me, of course you're gonna take from me. So even if you're not actively engaging in wars, you need the threat of waging war in order to ensure peace. Because the only way you have peace is if two you know, relatively strong groups decide it is more worth it to, to work with this person than to try to take what he has. Because if he can fight back and hurt me, and it's gonna be difficult for me to take from him, it might be better if we just work together, right? So war is necessary, even if it's not the waging of war, it's being skilled in war that is necessary. And you know, when I talk about the, the Roman dependence upon auxiliaries and at times mercenaries, this is very similar to what Niccolo Machiavelli talks about in his book, The Prince. He says, if you have a reliance on foreign mercenaries, if you have a reliance on 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 um, on foreign troops, and and your 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 army isn't built up of of your population, it's not built up of your handpicked soldiers that you have trained with, then the victory belongs to the the mercenaries. It belongs to the foreign troops that are helping you. Therefore, well, now you have to now you have to pay them back. You know, they might want lands now, and then you sort of destabilize. Um, the base of, of, of what your state is, right? And this this doesn't always end up badly. You you, you know you can you can find a way. Well, you know, your identity might become the identity of the foreign mercenaries, but it is a lot more difficult when you know you might have hired this army for the purpose of okay they're gonna take this kingdom over and then give it to me, you know, and I'll pay them to go on the way. Well, they're gonna be like no. We fought for this land. We conquered this kingdom. It should belong to us, not you. You know money. The idea of money. See. People think that money is power, and in many ways money is power. But the thing is, is that power is something greater than, than money, because if money was everything, people would, you know, these mercenaries, they'd accept this monetary payment um, in return for their services. But in reality, when they get a taste of power, they see the land. You know, you see the land, and, and, and you, that's, that's the real power. The real power is in the land. It's in the ability to produce more. It's in the ability to make more money, right? If you have the land, if you have the farms, 
Um, if you have access to the resources, the mines, the trade routes, then you can make more money. That's power. It's the ability to create. It's the ability to build. That's power. So, you know, when you become more um, dependent upon all these different forces for your power, well, then they they start to say, well, I deserve the power. And they're right. If they're doing the hard work, they do deserve the power. So it becomes very difficult to sort of balance this. And there's also this idea of of morality, right? I think something that, that uh, that's quite interesting today in Western civilization is this hyperfixation on on social progress, and, and you know you, you think of like what you what you you know the conception of woke culture, right? People, it's all about um, uh, you know fulfilling not fulfilling but fixing the wrongs of the past, you know, uh, healing the wounds of the past is a better way to describe it, and you know. It's it's interesting because the Roman Empire at, at the end towards the end uh, adopted Christianity and Christianity is very focused on on you know uh, turning the other cheek. It's very focused on 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 forgiveness and and living a peaceful life. And these are all beautiful things. But when this happens too fast and when you go into this idea of morality too fast, it comes from a position of weakness. So you know, are you a good Christian if if you, you try to help everyone, but then you forget to protect your own family, and then the people you're trying to help end up invading your lands and killing all of you, and now your family's dead. Does that make you a good Christian? No. I think, you know, and all the best Christians throughout our history were also warriors in many ways. Not all the best ones, but the best Christian kings, for example. The best Christian rulers were all warriors. So you, you say, well, what's a good Christian, right? And I don't think that what happened to Rome is a good indication of what you want in a Christian kingdom, because what happened is, you know, they might you might see people because they are comfortable because they have access to pleasure because they don't have pain and suffering they might turn to christianity and use it as an excuse like well i'm not joining the the army because i'm a peaceful man now when in reality the actual motivation might be well i don't want to fight i'm afraid you know um i don't want to fight i can just stay at home and relax right but then they'll use christianity as an excuse and say oh I can. Uh, I'm just. I'm. I'm a peaceful person now. I have no need to 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 dominate my enemies, right? But like I said, a good Christian uh, protects his family. A good Christian protects his homeland. And and um, in, in Rome, you see this this sort of uh, hyperfixation on morality, much as we do today. So people will use morality as an excuse to be weak, as an excuse to be decadent. They'll say, oh, no, I'm, I'm just trying to be a good, peaceful person. And then they'll forget that the German tribes, the barbarians, the strong, virile, hungry, ambitious German tribes are waiting in the north to come south and conquer your lands, burn your cities, take your women, take your loot, take your hard-earned gold. Well, in the case of many Romans, not so hard-earned, but you get the idea. They forget about that because they're hyperfixated on moralizing things, morality, helping others from a position of weakness, because it's not really about morality, it's really about, I am lazy, I am comfortable, you know, not suffering, I, I, am, I am seeking pleasure, I want to live the good life, but, but then they use morality as an excuse, so they use things like Christianity as an excuse, so like the Romans who adopt, many Romans who adopted Christianity, I don't think did so um, for salvation, I don't think they did so for good reasons, I think they did so as an excuse. Because you see, many of the great Christians throughout history were also warriors. And they were warriors because Christianity took a lot of, of war to, to protect it. Because you see, you take the Battle of Tours, um, when Charles Martel defeated the, the, um, the, Moorish, con the Moorish invaders who sought to, to invade Christendom, invade France. And you know who knows where they would have stopped afterwards. And he stopped them because he was a strong man. And he was powerful and he had an army. And they were strong men not willing to give up their lands. That is why I think a good Christian is, is someone who is also strong. You, you have to re recognize that, that you know. Defending your family is an integral part of, of, of being a human, being a man, and being, being strong. And if, if, if you use something like Christianity or religion in general, or morality, or social progressivism and social justice today, which I think is, is trying to replace Christianity, use it as an excuse to be weak, use it as an excuse to, to live a very worldly life. Because you take Christianity, for example, and social progressivism the way it's supposed to be, these are rejecting worldly things like material wealth, and, and these are rejecting worldly pleasures. Uh, you know, it's, it, Christianity is, a, is about, you know, helping, helping the, the unfortunate, um, helping, the, the, helping the people 
who live uh, disadvantaged lives, giving up your wealth for them so that they may live better and so that you can try to end their suffering, right? And same with social progressivism and, and the idea behind woke culture is supposed to be about equality and allowing everyone to live a good life. But that's not really what it's about. That's what it's supposed to be about. But the way that people actually acted out, the way the Romans acted out Christianity was not fighting in the military anymore, not defending the Roman borders, not defending the Roman homeland, growing weak. And, and the same way that you see this, this social progressivism in the modern uh, conception of morality in, in, the West, in Western civilization and the developed world, it's really just an excuse for people to, to seek worldly things. The idea behind Christianity and the idea behind social progressivism, it, it's supposed to be rejecting these worldly things and helping everyone, but it never really is about that. It's really an excuse for people to, to deny exceptionalism and to deny their responsibility, the responsibility to their country, the responsibility to, to their families, to safeguard the state, safeguard the people of their nation, and, and the people suffering throughout the world. A lot of the times, that a lot of the people that you see today that are very strongly socially progressive, they're not really doing anything to help the people of the world, the same way that many of the Roman Christians um, weren't. Now, the early Roman Christians, the very early ones, were, were very hardcore believers. They died, they were killed, they were persecuted. But then you have a lot of you know, Romans afterwards that adopt Christianity as a sort of fad. And while you have these hardcore early Roman Christians who are very dedicated to the doctrine, they're willing to die for their faith, the later Roman Christians kind of, you know, they adopt it because it's, it's essentially what's popular. There's no better way of saying it. The same way today, people accept social progressive movements because they are popular, because it gives them a sense of meaning. These are all similar people, the people in the Roman Empire, towards the end of the Roman Empire, uh, the, the Western man today, they're, they're weak, they are decadent, they, they, are, um, they are fixated with, with, with seeking pleasure, they're constantly seeking pleasure because their lives are easy, their physical lives are easy, survival is almost guaranteed, so they, they, they overindulge in these basic necessities, food, sex, you know, uh, they seek um, chemical stimulation, uh, they drink alcohol, they take drugs, you know, it's really the same in Rome. They become what, what Nietzsche will describe as the last man, the last man, and I've talked about this concept many times, someone who is constantly desiring more pleasure, who does not care about the status quo, they don't care about helping other people. It's like that Fight Club quote, like, um, I don't care about uh, world hunger or, or, or famine, I care about, you know, um, this person on, I, I care about this celebrity on TV, or I care about catching up with this TV show. That's a, that's a very loose paraphrasing of, of the actual quote from Fight Club. When I do a video on Fight Club, I'll get into that more. But Nietzsche's last man is unconcerned with these, 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 genuine, um, these genuine issues in the world, the suffering of people and, and the pain of people. And like I said, pain and suffering lead to human innovation. These are all things that drive us forward. But they're also things that if we see another human suffering and experiencing pain, as a Christian, for example, you, you want to take on the suffering of the world as a Christian. I truly believe that as, as a Christian myself. I think that's one of the most fundamental uh, aspects of Christianity for me, at the very least, is accepting the suffering of the world. So if you yourself are born into pleasure and born into comfort, you must seek suffering of the world by trying to alleviate the suffering of others. And, and that suffering of them, if you take on their suffering like it's your suffering, that's going to drive your own human innovation. Because if you act like their problems are your problems, and you accept the responsibility of helping your fellow man, then that pain and suffering is going to help you, because it's going to give you something to overcome, right? And if we see each other more in a fraternal light as brothers and, and a greater family, that's what's going to happen. So a lot of times, like I said, that's not really what's going on with these 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 newer Roman Christians and these these current moralists today, these, these social progressive types. They don't really care about helping others. Social progressivism you know, Christianity for, for the late Romans and the newer Christians, it wasn't about helping others. It's not about justice. It's about themselves. It's about the fact that they don't want to be exceptional. They are too lazy and too comfortable and too numb to pleasure, and too, too, too absent, uh, too much, you know, too easy of a life, absent of pain and suffering. They don't want to be exceptional because they'd rather relax. They'd rather eat well. They'd rather, you know, live a good, comfortable life. Therefore, 
they're not willing to strive for more. So they use these things as an excuse. They take the, the bad aspects or the bad interpretations of these things. The, the, Roman, the Roman Christians will say, okay, well, we don't want to fight in wars. You know, we don't want to conquer other peoples. We want to live in peace. But they'll deny their responsibility to, to, to fight when necessary, to defend their homeland, to defend their families, to defend the people of the empire. Um, the same way that moralists today, same thing. They'll deny the reality that there are enemies that we have in the world that want to kill us and want to take what we have. And we have a responsibility to our families and to the people to protect them from our enemies. You, you know, the reason why I mentioned, you know, the potential fall of Western civilization in the United States, you see a lot of uh, the, American, uh, the rivals of America growing strong. China um, is growing very strong. You have Russia, while they, they seem to have been in a bit of a decline recently, they're certainly aggressive with, with what power they have left. So you have enemies that want you dead and want to take what you have, and, and yet you're, you're, you're fixated on, on, on uh, morality only to the extent that it justifies your inaction. It justifies you not getting some skin in the game, you not striving to be more, you not deciding that I have a responsibility to seek pain and suffering and make the world a better place. That's, that's what morality becomes. For, for many people in the modern world, the, the Western man, um, the, the last man, Nietzsche's last man, right? And, and it's interesting because I think this, this, gets, um, this gets exacerbated with, with the current economic system. And I won't speak too much on the Roman economic system because it was a little bit different. But you look at the modern economic system. Um, you have the Industrial Revolution. You have division of labor. You have man becoming economic man. The economic man is a cog in, in, in the greater machine. Which, which is the greater economy. You have individuals at the top who, who have the means of production and they, and they produce all these things. And, and um, to them, each worker is, is just a cog in the machine. They're not an individual. They are a means to an end. You know, people like Kant and Heidegger say man's, man is a means in himself. Man should not be a means to an end. But man has become an economic means to an end for many people that want more wealth, that want more power. And what happens is, you have a consumer society, and you have different people in these consumer societies. You have the people that produce things. Um, recently, that's been uh, that's been uh, exported to to well, not exported, but uh, what's outsourced to, to to countries like China, uh, other countries in Southeast Asia. They're producing these goods. You have um, people in the Congo mining lithium batteries. Their labor is being exploited to produce these goods, which goes to the middle class, and the middle class consumes these goods. So they become consumers. And the economic machine is, is built like this. Everybody has an economic contribution and, a, and, a, and an economic consumption. And that becomes everything that fuels life. Your identity is, is your job. It, the first question most people ask you is, what do you do for a living? Your identity is how you contribute economically to the machine and also how you consume. See, creativity used to create uh, create for the sake of art, used to create for the sake of, of, of something that moves man, that, that taps into to our inner Dionysian side, our connection to the land, our connection to nature. That's what art, true art is. But art has become creating for the sake of consumption. People play, or people create bullshit music because people, a wider audience is going to enjoy this and they're going to be able to sell more, um, more of their songs, make more money. It doesn't become about the art, it becomes about appealing to a wider audience and, and making more money. See, people used to express themselves by how they created, creating real art, but now they express themselves with either how they consume or, or by creating things that people can consume. And you look at this, you can see this in, 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 in America today, the most su successful people are the, are the people that create something that can be consumed, even, even good creation. So you take Tesla, for example. Elon Musk is, is obviously a very smart guy, and, and what he's doing with Tesla is quite great. SpaceX, he, he, is, he is genuinely contributing to human innovation, but none of, his, none of his innovations would be successful if it wasn't for the consumer side of it. He's also very good at marketing, and the reason Tesla is so successful is because of how they market and the fact that people want to consume Tesla products. So it's not the fact that he's creating these great new innovative technologies. It's that it's, it's attractive for the consumer. It's attractive to be consumed by the population. And this isn't Musk's fault. He has to play the game if he wants to do the real work. But it's sad that he has to. It's sad that in order to be successful, he has to create something that can be consumed. And this is what you see with, with our current economic system. And you know that's just the way it is, obviously. And you're not going to be able to change it. But there are ways, perhaps, that you can 
that you can uh, reinvigorate um, something that that is separate from from just this simple creation of of of, uh, of, of monetary of, of like of a very dark consumption I guess I would say like this this I just I, I I think of this this concept of of creating just for the sake of consumption rather than the sake of art or, or innovation and I see this with 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 the success of like social media for example and how much money that has made people if you if you look in regards to human innovation to 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 fulfilling something that solves suffering that solves pain that solves an issue what does Facebook really solve what do, what do things like Instagram really solve or Snapchat or all these social medias? In some ways, they're very good, right? It allows people to stay in touch who don't live near each other. It allows people to catch up after many years. But it also has, has this, this very negative effect. Like you think of the fear of missing out. People display their great lives and people look at that and think that that's how their lives should be. And they start comparing themselves to other people. Um, you also have people wasting their time just scrolling on social media. It's quite addicting, really. You see, you know, your new your new TikToks, your new Instagram reels, your YouTube shorts, right? Of course, YouTube shorts can be good. I've done a few myself if they're informational. But most of it is just, you know, stupid consumption. Um, and, and that's what happens in, in this machine that, that we live in. You know, you want to call it the matrix, let's call it the matrix, right? Economic man is defined by his economic contribution and his economic consumption. And the economic man is the Western man. It is Nietzsche's last man. And this is the fall of Western civilization, is that we have gone from being strong and virile, experiencing suffering and pain, which drives us to create human innovation, to, to create new things, to invent new things, to, to reach the stars, to, to reach the moon, to reach Mars, um, to conquer new lands. Uh, to explore, to, 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 to aspire to be something more, to be something great. We have lost that. For, for much of Western history, there was sort of this, this Faustian, uh, there's this Faustian relationship with nature because the world was endless. You know, people didn't realize there was limits to the world, uh, when, especially before the Americas were discovered. You have people or, or even once the Americas are discovered, it seemed like endless. You you, you watch the movie uh, New World with, with uh, what's his name, Colin, something Colin, Colin something, you know, uh, I'm, you, I might have lost you, but there's this film called New World, and it's and it's um it's this fictional account of, of sort of the relationship between Pocahontas and and uh, this um this this West this like English. Uh, Explorer, and obviously the real story of Pocahontas is quite sad. She died very young. She was basically, you know, stripped from her land. You know, I get it. It's horrible stuff. But this is a fictional movie. But it, what I got out of it is that it really shows you the endless expanse of America and what that must have felt like as as a European seeing this endless land, you know, with bountiful resources and endless opportunities. And obviously a lot of horrible things happen to it. You have the decimation of the Native American population. Um, it's horrible. I'm not going to deny that. But what you also had was this idea that the world was endless and that we'd always have more access to resources. You know, Faust, what, what it means to be Faustian is to have no regard for the future just now, right? Because we never thought that there would be a future in which all this might be inhabited one day, in which all the resources might be gone. And maybe we can renew that Faustian spirit with space, right? Space seems endless right now, much as much in the same way that, that, that the Americas seemed endless for the Europeans. So maybe that Faustian spirit doesn't need to die yet. But certainly in regards to Earth, uh, that Faustian uh, spirit could, could, uh, could, be, could become too fast and sort of overtake our technological advancement to reach the stars, and then you might lose all the resources on Earth before you, ha before you can use those resources to fuel our space, space exploration or what have you, right? So it's just sort of interesting, uh, maybe dichotomy there. I don't know if I'm using the word correctly exactly, but you know, we're, we're, what we're really, what I'm really trying to paint for you is this this relationship between the early man, and I don't mean early man like caveman, but like the man who lives in in, in the hard times, right? Hard times create strong men. Uh, that strong, almost barbaric man who's willing to do anything. It's willing to do hard things. Sometimes it's going to seem morally gray, right? They're going to have to kill. They're going to have to wage war. They're going to have to battle to seek their destiny. Um, whereas the modern man, you know, a good example might be uh, the narrator from Fight Club. You know, he's 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 attached to all his his, his material things. He's a consumer. 
Um, he doesn't really have an identity. You know, he's his job. But he's, you're not your fucking khakis, right? You're the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. You're not your job. And and that that's 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 why I think something that the West can still have is, is simulating suffering. Is 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 taking upon yourself to seek pain and seek suffering in a productive way. Like going to the gym, for example, is a very good example of this. Or doing martial arts, doing jujitsu. These are all healthy ways to experience pain and suffering. Take it upon yourself to experience pain and suffering and get a good reward out of it. You get more physically fit. You know, you learn to fight. These are all very, very good things. And this isn't just a physical thing. It's academic. That's why you study philosophy. You challenge your mind. You challenge your preconceived notions, right? You have to seek suffering and pain, both physically and mentally. The warriors is the twofold path of pen and sword. Musashi said it himself. You have to seek both. And morality is important in all this. We do want to create a better world for everyone. But we want to create a world where things don't get so, you know, prosperous and peaceful and, 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 and comfortable that we forget the reality. And the reality is that it takes sacrifice and it takes hard work to create a good world, to create a good society. Um, so I think, you know, my ideal world is, yes, you don't, you don't have these, these, these basic sufferings. You have, everyone has a right to basic survival. But then we as people seek certain levels of pain and suffering. It doesn't have to be bad. It could be good, like, playing sports, working out, engaging in martial arts. But if we lose that relationship to, to our evolutionary biology, we as humans need to be skilled at war. We need to be skilled physically and mentally. We need to be stimulated. We're not stimulated enough in, in this world where you have all these distractions. You have your social media. You have your video games. You have your online pornography. You have all these different things that distract you. And and uh, you start to lose sense of what it really means to be a human, to be connected with nature, to be connected with the land. Uh, how many people get an adequate amount of sunlight per day? How many people get an adequate amount of fresh air per day? How many people exercise enough per day? How many people eat too much sugar? How many people eat too many calories? How many people are eating healthy? How many people are filling themselves with GMOs and, and seed oils and all these other horrible things, right? So. Morality is incredibly important, I, I think, and I think it's important that we have conversations on morality. But I think the only way that you can truly ensure morality, good morality, and, and to ensure the world becomes a better place is if you help people and you seek to do the morally good thing only from a position of strength. Because from a position of weakness, you can be overtaken. Your kindness can be accepted as weakness. If you just help other people and get them stronger and stronger and stronger and you make yourselves weaker and weaker and weaker what's to stop those people those people who are now stronger than you to come and take what you have so you look at like what's happening today in regards to you know the united states and china china is getting stronger and stronger and stronger and we're getting weaker and weaker and weaker and and um you know you'd hope that china would just be the morally right people but but you know and and you know i think most people in china are are you know they're just like us they're no different than us but the the regime in China is 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 very power hungry. They're very ambitious, especially Xi Jinping. He will stop at nothing to fulfill his his goals. And you know that's 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 what everyone will do, right? You're all fighting for your own personal power, your state's power, your country's power. So you can't like pretend to not understand his motivations. But you as a country, we as Americans also need to to come up and and project our own strength upon our enemies and upon our rivals. So it goes both ways, right? Yes, we can understand why they want to be powerful. We can understand why they want to be strong, but we must be strong too to ensure our families survive, to ensure our way of life goes forward, to ensure our enemies and our rivals don't overtake us the way that it happened to the Romans, the way that Rome was overtaken by the barbarian tribes, the barbarian hordes, the, the Germanic warriors who were strong, virile, and barbaric. We need to ensure that we too are strong. Because what's happening today is Essentially, I think that Western civilization, um, NATO, uh, and the developed world, which you know, which which are liberal democracies. So this includes like Japan, South Korea. What's happening is you have this side of things: liberal democracies, NATO, the Western world, and then you have the BRICS nations. You have like uh, India, China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa. These are countries that aren't experiencing the same amounts of prosperity and, and comfort uh, and access to pleasure that we are in the Western world and in the developed world and the liberal democracies, they are experiencing pain and suffering. They are hungry for more. They are ambitious. They are prepared to sacrifice and work hard and struggle and bleed for something more, for, for, for a greater future for their families. They are the strong men born out of hard times, and we are the weak men born out of good times. But it doesn't have to be that way. 
And maybe we do lose, but maybe out of loss we realize that we need to be strong once more. But you hope that you don't get to that point. You hope that you're able to to recognize the necessity to, to defend and, and the necessity to make yourselves capable of defending what you have before it becomes too late, before you, you want to be able to recognize that we need to work harder and, and put more focus on, on developing ourselves and developing our strength and our, our capabilities for war before it happens, right? It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. So we hope that we don't have to lose and that it doesn't take loss to show us what we have lost, right? And that's that's our spirit. That's the Western spirit. That's that's the 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 Christian kings who fought against the Moorish conquest to defend Christendom. That's the Roman legionaries who 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 marched through forest and Gaul and and Germany and and were ambushed by by Germanic tribesmen and fought back and 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 won. That's that's in the spirit of the Roman legionary under Julius Caesar during um, during the the Battle of Alesia. I hope I'm saying that right. Elijah was it Elijah? Basically, where it was the, the most the integral battle uh, over Gaul, where Julius Caesar was surrounded on both sides. He was besieging a city, and and he was surrounded. They surrounded his his army, which was besieging the city. So he had to fight two sides. He had to fight the the Gaul, the army of Gaul within the city, and the army outside the city. And he won. It's in that Roman legionary who's scared, who's afraid, who who sees the the odds stacked against him and yet he pulls out his sword and he prepares to fight it's i think spangler said this he said i believe it was spangler was ernst Jünger, says that the, you know the most virtuous and the strongest and, and 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 the most exceptional man is the roman legionary who died at his post during the the eruption the volcanic eruption on mount vesuvius because he wasn't relieved um, by another century he stood his post near mount vesuvius as the lava came down as he was burned alive he stood his post because that was his duty because it was his responsibility that's the great man that's like their conception perhaps of the ubermensch right and you know that's an extreme example i think he should have left his post if if there's a volcanic eruption but you get the idea this idea is that through meaning and purpose even if that meaning and purpose is flawed at times if that meaning and purpose you know furthers humanity and it overcomes an obstacle it overcomes suffering and pain then it can be a very good thing and that's what's lost in the west it's what happened in rome rome lost their purpose they lost their meaning they stopped conquering they stopped wanting more they were satisfied with their empire it's big enough our empire is big enough you know they sort of lost the faustian spirit or well they had the faustian spirit but it wasn't in conquest anymore it was in partying hard seeing how much wine they could drink you know how many drugs they could take how much sex they could have not the good kind of faustian spirit not that any faustian spirit is necessarily good but certainly in terms of driving um, you know being the movers of human innovation sometimes it can be good while in the case of uh, just partying and uh, and seeking worldly pleasures uh, worldly comforts you know it's obviously a bad faustian spirit uh so you know this is something i'd like to revisit in the future but you know i think that this was a decent uh, introduction into uh into uh sort of the concept of the west the fall of the west and really the fall of many civilizations throughout history but specifically i'm trying to parallel the west to rome the modern man the economic man is weak he is not as 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 strong as as his ancestors really he's not as mentally strong as his ancestors his ancestors had they you know it's like in in fight club he says we have no great war no great depression our great war is a spiritual war our great depression is our lives that great war that great depression it gave them purpose it gave them suffering and pain to overcome and without that what's left without that we have a spiritual war we have our lives which has become the manifestation of the great depression and it is up to us to seek pain and suffering to overcome we can't continue living this this lifestyle of of hedonism and, and weakness and decadence we must seek pain and suffering ourselves and only by doing that can we really can we really overcome the fall of our civilization the fall of our society only through that can the west rise again and end its decline and i think that it can happen but it's going to be very difficult and it might get worse before it gets better but if we want the west to continue if we want our our beautiful experiment which is which is this this you know this this great idea 
which started all the way back in Greece, all the way back in Greece with their art and their tragedies and 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 their philosophy and their 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 desire for wisdom and knowledge and 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 their great ambition. It's an Alexander's dream. It's an Alexander wanting to cross the world, conquering everything he lays his eyes upon, to unite the peoples of the world, to create Babylon, the center of, of cultural exchange. It's in his desire to, to reach India and motivate his men to follow him, even though they haven't seen their families for, for many years. It's in Julius Caesar who holds his ground against the Gaulish tribal warriors it's in it's in this astronaut who, who who goes up into space knowing he may never return. It's in it's in you and it's in me. And maybe it's not awaken us right now, but we can reawaken that that Western spirit that that has lay that has laid dormant for so many years, and we can reinvigorate it and move forward towards a greater future. And this Western spirit, it's not just in Europe; it, it exists in many places. It's not just a European thing. This Western spirit. It's it's I think it's innate in in all humans and that all humans can tap into to this 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 idea of Western civilization and contribute to it. It's this it's this desire for more. It's a desire to to conquer new lands, to explore new lands, and and, and maybe in this case it's it's conquering the stars, it's conquering space and and exploring exploring the vast expanse of of nothingness ahead of us, you know, going into the void, maybe never to return, but doing it anyway, just for the sake of greatness and for the sake of exceptionalism. I think I've said my piece. It's getting a little bit late. Uh, I hope the audio quality wasn't too bad. I know that it's not as good as it usually is because I don't have my mic. Who knows? Maybe it's better. Probably not. But uh, if you listen this long, uh, thank you for tuning in. I um, hope everyone's having a good day. Uh, I'll be back home in about two weeks and i'll be back to my normal setup until then i'm going to try to do a few more of these videos we'll see this is definitely a topic i want to revisit i always say that about most of the things that i talk about but i want to revisit this topic again but if there's something i want you to go away with is that suffering and pain are necessary for human innovation you need an, you need a problem to solve if you live a decadent lifestyle where you know you're eating a lot you're watching porn you're, you're drinking a lot, you're doing drugs, you're partying all the time. See, it, it can manifest in different ways. There's, you know, the loser in his basement, you know, uh, who's, 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 who's watching porn and, and uh, eating too much fast food. But then you also have the person partying all the time. That's not a good lifestyle either. If you just party all the time, you just drink all the time, you just sleep around all the time, and you don't put in the work, you don't put in the work necessary to move society forward, then you're just as bad as the loser in his basement. You both are losers, really if you're not doing something to contribute to this greater idea, this greater human advancement, you're also a loser. But you can become a winner. You know, we might all be losers right now. We might be all short of the expectation. Me, you, everybody. But as long as we have this idea, this 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 thing to grasp towards, it doesn't matter if we're failing right now because if we if we at least know where we're going, then we can chart out a path to get there. And we might it's not going to be just up. It's going to be up and down, up and down and it's not going to be a steady progression all the time but as long as we have the end goal our end state and we strive towards that and you know we have this ideal then at the very least we can say we tried and we put everything we had and uh, we might fall short we might fail ultimately but in the journey we might end up somewhere pretty close to where we originally planned on getting you know you you Aim for the stars, land on the moon. I think Neil Armstrong died a fulfilled man, right? Is he dead? I think he's dead. Hmm, sort of a morbid thing to consider, but landing on the moon is landing on the moon isn't so bad, you know. So let's keep that in mind, and uh, let's not let let the West fall. As Western men, let's let's do something about that. So yeah, as always, uh, this is the Warrior Philosopher building the foundations of the warrior philosophy. We'll see you next time.